I mean, it's a bit thick skin to ask you guys to follow me on Instagram, but um, because I'm in advertising, the skin gets thicker and thicker over time. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for having me and all the speakers who've been really amazing throughout this morning. I hope you guys enjoyed yourselves and for still being here and not like leaving halfway like you would in lecture. So, uh, I'm going to be talking about the idea of creativity and why you can't learn it in school. So what do I do? Um, I understand not all of you here are in the creative industry. Um, not all of you here are in the design industry and so on and so forth. So I'd like to give you a background of what do I actually do. I mean, if you think of it, you don't call an accountant by the, the adjective of his job, which is to be calculative, right? You don't call an accountant calculative director. You don't call these people according to their job. But for some reason, I guess in advertising, we call ourselves creatives and we are led by that way. So my job is basically to point at screens and tell people what to do uh, in the ideal situation. But most often than not, is to think of ideas, make sure the ideas are fresh, uh, inspiring, new, uh, pushing my team to come up with new stuff, so that we're always at the forefront of the, of the industry. So people think advertising, they think of flyers, they think about all the stuff you get in spam mails, your pop-up ads. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we don't do stuff like that. I mean, I hate pop-up ads. I have a pop-up blocker on my own, um, on my own uh, safari. But basically, we do communications. Uh, we want to tell a story, we want to help brands tell their story, sell their product. But more importantly, I think our job is to make sure that people identify the product, whether or not it's something that you want or don't want. We want to make the connection. So creative direction, I give people direction on how to be creative, uh, how to get better ideas. I don't tell them how to be a creative, I tell them how to improve their idea, improve their craft. So clients come to us with a product or a problem. Um, usually it comes in a brief, they tell us what their requirements are, they have a new launch, they have a certain whether it's a ministry or culture, they want to um, pop communicate a new uh, propaganda, if you will. And our job is to think of a creative idea. What's the best way to do that and how to get it to market? And then we go into execution. Not killing someone, uh, but basically just bringing it up to market, whether it's a film, a website, an app, so on and so forth. And along the way, hopefully, we win awards. Uh, the reason why we like and we chase awards is not because we're vain, partially, uh, but it's because we find that having awards is just a way of Getting recognition from the industry, from your peers, from your bosses' bosses, from people in the industry to know that, hey, that is a good idea. And it's important to us because that sharpens us and that improves us for the next year when we do new work and new, new awards. So my story, I think I just want to give you guys a quick background um, so that you don't think I'm just talking fluff and I'm not even here, I'm just dressed to look like a creative director and all these are just made up stories. And also at the same time, I just want to give you an idea of where I came from. Um, went to secondary school, normal school and all that stuff and how, how basically the journey uh, presented itself and landed me to where I am right now on a Saturday afternoon talking to you guys about TED, on TED, TED, TEDx. So I'm 33 years old, just made it to be a millennial uh, just by the skin of my teeth. So I can, I can still consider myself a youth. Uh, otherwise, I may not be invited here, I'll be too old, I'll be like 10 adult or something. Uh, so I've been, since, since young, I've always been interested in drawing. Uh, I love to draw. I'm always sketching stuff. My first memory of drawing was Porsches. Uh, my dad would draw one and I'll copy it, obviously. Uh, I can't draw my own. And then it progressed to killing, people killing one another. Uh, violence, some acts of violence and stuff like that. As you would, as boys would. I'll show you some examples of that. Um, so I dug up an old archive uh, of books. I, keep, I still keep it because I'm partially a hoarder. I like to keep my stuff. Um, people killing one another, special powers, got rocks drawing, laser lights. Uh, these are things I did in primary school and secondary school. These are all stuff I would do after my homework. I would finish my homework very fast so I can do my drawings. It's just like a bit of an obsessive thing. I do it in class even. Uh, teachers would be like, hey, what are you doing? Where's my project? When the homework, I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't do Or like, I'll be sketching my textbooks when teachers are talking. Not, not good advice to be students, uh, but to be honest. But how that served me well was basically when I went to school, when I went to poly, uh, when I went to secondary school, for, sorry, uh, I hated art. I hated, the, I hated the, 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 the sort of art we were taught in school. I hated to have to paint uh, apple. I hated the fact that I had to draw an orange. Um, to me, it's like, yeah, I can, I can see it. Do, you not, do I need to draw it for you? Um, <laughs> so the thing is, I'm thinking, it's like, as a, if I'm doing art, shouldn't I be creating something that is new, something that is refreshing? So my portfolio to school, I went to Nia Poly, by the way, no get offended, Singapore Poly. Um, <laughs> My portfolio was basically made up of textbooks of drawings. Drawings I did in my textbooks, drawings I did in my sketchbooks, exercise books. I had the massive school bag of it. So the lecturers would like, be surprised that I came up with all those stuff and not, supposed, and not the usual like A4, A2 portfolio and stuff. So that's quite unorthodox. 
uh, but I didn't end up doing the course anyway. I changed my mind. A bit fickle. <laughs> so, um, and then I discovered digital photography. Back in, 2000, back in 2004, there was no such thing as a smartphone. Uh, we had crappy 3310s who lasted a lifetime. This was my first camera, which I bought for my, bought for my dad. Uh, and it was the first foray into photography, if you will. This was the first photo on my first photo walk I, took, I, I went. Uh, obviously, it was color graded on Photoshop. Uh, there's no way you can be so blue. Uh, and then it just inspired me, like, wow, I really love photography. It's something I really love. I, I enjoyed it. At the same time, I was learning Photoshop in year one. And as you can tell, there's a watermark at the side that I can't remove because I lost the original picture. So thanks to my old self, I can't copyright, I can't steal my old work. Uh, <laughs> so that's my photography. I, it's, it's been a journey I started when I was young. So just new things that I was trying all the time. So then I went to the army. In the army, I kept on doing design work. Uh, I kept on doing photography work. Not as my main task, I was an officer, but it was my way of finding solace, my way of finding an escape amongst the tough trainings, among the outfield raid, all that nonsense. Uh, my camera was my es actually escape, only escape. In fact, it was a literal escape because uh, my instructors would let me put down my, all my gear and say, hey, go up there, take photo. <laughs> or like, hey, take the guy suffering. Ah, then I go and take photo. <laughs> all, my, all, all my stuff will be on the floor. I'm like, yes, camera, awesome, you know. And I go and I take picture of these guys and they're suffering, look at me like, what are you doing? And then, you know, I'm like, yeah, sorry, taking photographer, you know. So photographer, give me some faces. So, uh, also I did some um, call for the shopping work. Doing this picture, transforming it into a band of brothers. <laughs> because they know you can do Photoshop, they're like, hey, please do it. So no choice, you know. A lot of those things you do. Oh, I found out passion. It was something that at that point I was I haven't really think of, thought of a career yet. I mean, I had an inkling that I wanted to do something like this, but not exactly what yet. Because at the time I wasn't really exposed or not sure what I wanted to do. So that's, that's when I was blessed enough to be able to go to the UK. Um, I studied in the University of the Arts London. Um, portfolio this time was more, 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 sub more substantial, lah, not the textbooks and all that stuff. So I was able to get in. Um, life there was interesting. Life in London was interesting. Uh, lots of hard work, late nights, but lots of partying. Uh, lots of um, going out, doing stuff. Basically living life, if you will. Uh, being overseas allowed me to be cut off from the people back home. So out of my comfort zone, I had to make new friends, I had to find new people to talk to find a life, reinvent myself. Um, I think that's really important, whether you're not, you're creative, or just as a person as a whole, is you need a, a space to rethink about what you are doing, rethink about what you're doing for life, what you are, I mean, all this existential stuff, right? Um, but at the same time, get drunk. Um, so, I always believe you have to work hard, but play harder, because there's no point working hard and play less, then you become very boring and like, no, no, not inspired at all. So that's my life in London. Uh, some, old, some old graphic design work, uh, just to show, that I have done old stuff like that, vectors and all that kind of fancy stuff. Uh, I even tried starting my own t-shirt company, um, so some t-shirts. I think just, just ways to get it out of my system, like all these things were in my body, it's like, ah, I just need to design something, I need to sell it, I need to upload it somewhere, get someone to see it. And obviously at the time, no Instagram too, I can't spam on Instagram or social media, it was Friendster, I think, at the time. Anybody who remember Friendster? Okay, you guys are old. Okay. <laughs> so some old graphic design work I had when I was young. And then, uh, my full-time career started in 2010. Uh, I got my first job in London. Uh, how that happened was, wasn't, I don't believe in luck. Uh, I believe in, when, when luck is basically when opportunity meets preparation. Throughout the time I was there, every holiday, every summer break, I was trying to do an internship. Every break, every alternate days, I was trying to do freelance work. I was trying to get more work done, not leaving it to the school to tell me what I should be doing in my portfolio. I wanted to go out there, get my stuff seen, get my stuff done by real clients and just basically get the sun out there. A school can only give, bring you this much work, but if that's all you're going out to the industry with, your lecturers, I mean not your lecturers, your future employees will always see the same sort of work in every portfolio. You always need to find a way to improve, to show something different, like you did, did this for a bank, you did this for something else, you did this for a friend. I think you just need to put yourself out there, don't rely on the school system to give you portfolio, you have to build it on yourself, build it outside of school. And that's kind of landed me in my first job, uh, and then Awards came, uh, woo, awesome. Um, and then my, my full-time career started, I got married, and then I'm back to Singapore. So passion is very important in everything you do. I love driving, um, I love camping, uh, I love exercising. Didn't used to, I used to was in a tough club, now I became so odd. Uh, and obviously Instagram, because I'm not pursuing photography as a profession, Instagram is my outlet for it. So thank God for Instagram. So my highlight reel basically is just to give you an idea of what I do in my, in my job, um, all the projects and stuff, that's on the other, other page.
it and that's like myself trying to feel good about my existence. So I pulled this, all these things up. Uh, thank you very much. That is the highlight reel. You have no idea how much loss, how much lack of sleep, how much blood tears, lost weekend, time away from wife, time away from family, went into all this work. Highlight reels are basically what we like to people to see. And I think it's also quite true nowadays in social media. Your highlight reel is what you put online. And it's very easy to be discouraged by what you see. But I forget that actually your journey is what people don't see. You're behind the scenes. You're comparing your behind the scenes to the highlight reel. And that's very hard to compete against. I'm just quoting a pastor here, so don't take my word for it. <laughs> so, my idea of creativity, um, basically it's very simple. It's about thinking different. Um, you look at the word, the word creativity, the, the root word is, create, is to create. What are you creating? So, create. You need to create things with your mind. Uh, I mean, if you believe in God, God created the world, it's all in the head. What you think you can create out of your mind is what creativity is about, basically. Think differently and produce the unexpected. I think that's what creativity is about. If you're producing the same, same all the time, even if it's same, same but different, it's basically the same thing anyway. I think how you value creativity or how value, how value, how creativity is valued is basically when you've not seen it before and you go, wow, it's disruptive, there's something different, you're pushing a boundary in some form or other. And I'm, not just, I'm, not, I'm not just talking about advertising, it could be in fashion, it could be music, it could be film, photography, it could be anything. Even business can be a form of art. It can be a form of creativity. I see business people, uh, thinking of great ideas to launch the products and getting the products out there, or how even they even tweak the products to be more relevant to the, to the market, for example. There's no formula, there is no um, two cups of coffee and three hours of sleep uh, gives you good ideas. There's no formula, you have to try your own formula. My, my, one, of my, one of my ways uh, is going, going to the toilet. Uh, I find myself more re most relaxed. Anyway, too much information. Uh, creativity requires craft, because creativity is the mind part, right? When it comes out, it can be a great idea, but how do you bring it to life? How do you uh, give it its fullest potential? How do you give it enough um, craft or execution to make it come to life that people go, I get that idea? Because you can come up with a great idea on paper, but you're not, not going to put that paper into the air and people are going to see the paper, right? You're going to think of a way to bring it to life, whether it's a love story or something like that. So you pass craft. Even in like icons and all that stuff, your idea needs to, be, needs to go down with something physical or tangible that can be seen or heard. And that's where craft comes in. It's very important now that people pay more attention to craft because they just think that, oh, I want to be a creative, I'm just going to sit there in my chair and think of ideas. But if you just think about ideas, you're going to be in the clouds. You're not going to create anything that is going to be come up that someone can relate to or be produced. Creativity isn't a technical skill. Uh, this was shot by a street photographer, Ig Bing Chia. You guys may have heard of him on Instagram. Uh, he shot my wedding photo, uh, the one on the right. Uh, he's, he's a very good photographer because First and foremost, he shoots everything on his iPhone. Now he has progressed to more complicated cameras and stuff like that. But initially, all his street photographies were all done on iPhone. And it's really about just getting the angle, getting the, the, everything properly done. Not, 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 not properly done, but getting the, the story across through a picture as opposed to, what's the f-stop? What lens am I using? Is this going to blow up to A3? I mean, there's so many things your salesman at the camera shop will tell you. Those are just technical skills. Do not get hung up on that. You can go out and shoot with the worst camera, but the best camera you can have is the one in your hands. Creativity is intelligence, having fun. You need to have fun. Einstein clearly having a lot of fun. Uh, you can't have fun if your mind is not relaxed or, or having play. That's why I said working hard, but play harder. And I, can't, I, I guess I got to quote my own founder of my agency, David Ogilvy. In the world of business, uh, for, for an advertising creative, it's useless to be a creative unless I can actually sell the idea to someone. I can sell that across to someone to believe in it or to buy it. Divine discontent basically is... I think as all, as all creatives in any form have a certain level of divine discontent. You're never happy, you're never satisfied with what you see out there, with what you hear out there. You always want to change. And then, I think that keeps you going. That's a form of motivation. You should embrace it. And not worry about why am I always hating stuff or being such a hater. Failures, trials and tribulations, you will face, a, you will face a lots of rejections. People will tell you, no, bad idea. Keep it. Don't worry about it. Don't think that, oh, that's the end of my life. I'm not going to be creative anymore. I have no record of how much ideas I've been thrown away, shoved, in my, shoved down the toilet bowl. There's so many things that have gone out, gone out and there's also so many that more that got rejected. So don't worry about rejections. Uh, go something, make your skin thicker, like a crocodile. <laughs> Screw this. You might sometimes feel like this is cool. <sighs> don't want to do this anymore. But to be honest, you have to keep on going. Just soldier on. And I just want to ask a quick question. Don't have to answer me out loud. Do you guys end up here in poly because you really wanted to or was it because of grades? Because you didn't do well in all levels. I think the main thing to take away, I think the main point about that is no matter where you are right now, you need to make the best out of it. 
uh, whether or not it's something you love or hate, find something else to do that is not within what you're doing right now. You can be in a course that has like five modules and only one of them is what you love. Put your 200% into what you love. Just pass the rest, to be honest. <laughs> uh, that's that, that's kind of what I did uh, in my course in SCOM. There were so many topics. I did my essays here, dissertations there. You know what? I just focus on the creative stuff, the design, the photography, the advertising stuff. I just passed those. And in the end, I just took the work that I got A grades and distinctions for because I loved it and used it in my portfolio. To be honest, I don't even remember what I studied for in the other, sub um, in the other subjects. <coughs> so don't tell me, uh, if you guys fail, it's not my fault. Um, <laughs> how to succeed? Uh, not as a creative, but in anything. Um, it's not how you start, but how you finish. I don't have time, so you can watch this video online. It's Dave Wattle. He was the last guy in the race and he came first. It's not how you start, it's about how you finish. I'll play this. Okay, it's the one the cat is going to be first. Spoiler. Uh, it's not how good you are, it's how good you want to be. This is really true. Um, I never thought I was best, I was the best, I never thought I'd be really good. I'm not, I don't even think I'm really good now, but I just want to keep getting better, I want to be the best, I want to be good, I want to be better, better, better. Better than myself, not better than the next guy, better, not better than another creative director, but you are your, pretty much your own competition, and that should be the way, because everyone's journey is different, everyone has a different starting point, a different um, baggage, and different support, if you will. So it's how good you are. Okay, so my Chinese teacher will be very happy that I can remember some Chinese because I feel it, I feel it very badly. I won't try to pronounce it because it will sound terrible, but basically what it means is there is always a mountain higher. Uh, someone will be better than you, there will always be someone better than you. Just gonna embrace it. You can't be the best and be number one, then you know, that's kind of like boring. There's always someone better than you, you may be the best speaker, but there'll be a best singer, for example. So many things, don't compete yourself to the next guy. That was a picture I took in the gym. Some, only the good ones are point out. Eh? Okay. Five C's of a creative. Chop, chop. C, chop, chop. Um, cats. Oh. Cats. Um, cats because it's funny. Lah. Not, not that you really make less anything. And memes. If you don't create a meme, you have to get a cat. You need to have a cat. Uh, or a pub. Or a pub or a cat. You need to make a meme. Coffee. We love coffee because we have so little sleep. Uh, but seriously, curiosity is very important. You need to have curiosity. You need to always challenge. You need to always ask why, ask the right questions, ask questions. Uh, and always be trying to find out more. That's very important as a creative. Courage, you need to have balls. Uh, you need to dare. Dare to break the rules. Find out, what, find out what the rules are and go break it. Not just do it blindly, right? You need to know what the rules are first before you can break it. And then just courage to try something different. Step out of the comfort zone. Step out of the red circle, for example. <laughs> Nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> Go crazy! I mean, you don't be creative, you'll be crazy, right? you'll, be, you'll be boring, then just wear a suit and tie and go to work. No offense, um, but I'm just saying, if you really want to be creative, just don't be crazy, just let, allow yourself to let go a bit. I mean, if you really shave your head one side or two side, uh, shave your eyebrow, maybe not, but uh, <laughs> just go crazy. Don't be afraid, don't hold back. You know? Conviction, very important. You need to believe in what you do. You need to believe in your idea, your campaign, your project. Actually, conviction works for everyone. doesn't matter whether or not it's advertising or creative work. You need to believe in what you do. If you, if you don't believe in what you do, how do you expect your lecturer to believe in that? It's like, hey, lecturer, this is okay, lah. This is what you think. Lecturer will be like, yeah, so so only. You know, he said, oh, lecturer, this is the best thing ever. Lecturer will be like, sure, really? Well, not bad, lah. Then, you know, you can try to skew a bit, lah. But you need to believe in it first. You need to believe in it first as conviction, otherwise, no one will buy it, you know? <laughs> Lastly, care. You have to care. What's the point of having creative? Creativity if you don't care. You need to care for society, care for people. Empathy is really important. If you have no empathy, I think my boss always said, creatives are the most empathy, have the, have the most empathy in the office because we feel a lot of things for the audience, for the people, the old people, the young people, because we need to communicate a story to them. So we always try to put ourselves in everybody's shoes to the point that we feel like we are oversensitive. That's why creatives cry, they scream, they yell, very emotional, because I think to a certain extent they're feeling a lot of things. They're getting a lot of empathy coming to them and they try to translate that into a story, translate that into a, into a project, into a film. So that's how to succeed. Okay, now why, why you can't learn creativity in school. Uh, lecturers, I'm to leave now. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to offend anyone. Um, I'm not going to play this video because of time. Jack Ma, cool stuff, very smart guy, very rich, but I'll skip this video because of time. But basically all he's saying is no point teaching students the same thing that you can get a robot to do. The more you get them, you know, in the future, 30 years from now, AI will take over. So when AI takes over, and robots take over, and everything is being automated, what's the point of having a student there who knows how to do the same thing as a robot? Because they can do it cheaper and without, and with less pay. Um, 
something I really have grudge with is our intelligence are graded by the same thing for everyone. I mean, I think you guys believe the same thing, or, or at least if you're doing badly in school, you feel like, oh, the system sucks, it's not for me. Um, but whether or not you're getting a monkey to climb the tree and getting the elephant to climb the same tree and grade the elephant on how well he can climb the tree, it's not fair. True, but life isn't fair, so let's move on. Um, <laughs> what, what you need to do is basically just learn how to do it, embrace it, and then moving on. So I just embrace skip. Fear of failure in school. In school, your grades, your grades make and break the students, right? How well you graduate, uh, where, what school you go to next, whether, they are, whether you pass the girl or the boy or your grades. Fear of failure impedes creativity, impedes your progress because you're not, you, don't, you don't find yourself ex exploring, you don't find yourself experimenting or trying options and doing stuff because all you have in your mind is what's going to get me the A, what's going to get me the A and distinction or the grade or whatever that is. And I think that's a problem. Um, Yes, you need to get a grade, but at the same time, you shouldn't let the fear of getting a bad grade affect you. I've failed in certain projects a few times, sometimes actually on purpose, just to see whether actually this ad, for example, or this design I made, was actually something that the lecturer would buy. If the lecturer bought it, like, oh, it's interesting. If he didn't, I knew he wouldn't buy it. But it's just my way of testing the water, just try it out. It's not the end of, it's not the, end of the world, right? So don't, don't be afraid. And nobody wants to be uncool in school. Um, Everybody wants to be the cool guy, going to the cool parties, going to the scene here, Insta story here, Insta story there, being everywhere, right? But nerds are cool, man. You need to be a nerd, okay? You have to put your time into your work, your, your projects to be the nerd, to be, to be the one that spends so much time on it, you become the expert. And that's what nerds are. Nerds are no longer just the bookworm, right? They're basically people who are good at their craft. So don't be afraid to be good at what you do, and at the sacrifice of your time outside, and the sacrifice of time with, with, with like frivolous stuff that Two years down the road, like, oh, I, can't remember, I can't even remember what music was playing at the concert, you know? So, don't worry about being uncool. Uh, so, like I mentioned, I hate, I hate doing art in school because I always have to copy. They were always made to copy something, and then you're graded on how well you can copy. For example, if you have to copy Ronaldo's face. I mean, if, you, if, if, if I were the guy, I would probably make a face like that, just to like, piss the lecturer off. Uh, so, I hate copying. Copying is the reason why there's so many clients out there always telling you, I want a project like B, because that company did it, can you do the exact same thing? Well, I tell you, vomit blood. So the thing, so I think this sort of behavior, I don't, maybe it started from young, maybe it started because they have no idea of how to start originally, they, they don't know how to embrace original thinking, or embrace something that maybe scares them. If it scares you, actually it's a good thing. Sometimes we come up with new ideas that scares us, and then all the more we pursue, because our gut tells us that if that scares you, there's a reason why, because it's not, it's fresh, it's new, it's out of your comfort zone, it's not done before, and all the more when you do it, you go, wow, that was worth it. Then somebody will copy it. <laughs> so why you can't love creativity in school? And what now? Don't make gloom, quit school, go home. Yeah. Learn online, learn from YouTube, do lynda.com. Uh, the first thing you do is to change your mindset about school, what the school is meant to do for you. First thing, your lecturers are actually like your bosses. Okay? Lecturers are also like your clients. If you think of them that way, which I did, your job is to give them what they want. It's, it's like working in a very commercial way. You're giving the clients what they ask for in a brief that has your DNA on it. You need to give the clients and lecturers the same respect. But at the same time, you cannot see them as the one who gives you the answers. You have to give them the answers. And once you see them as a boss and client, you might change the way you produce your work. Ask and you shall receive. School, well, I find that in school, you learn more only when you ask. You only, find, you only learn more when you actually ask the right questions or get them to tell you specific things to learn from. Then they tell you, because the lecturers have so much information, so much experience that they will not be able to tell you everything. But if you don't ask, you don't get. <coughs> Lastly, school is like practice for the real world. When the text comes out. Classmates are like your colleagues. They are like your future teammates. You may not like them, you may hate their guts, but you have to work with them. Okay, um, I think the practice is all the people's skills, your soft skills, how you manage the team, if you're a team leader, if you're working with people you don't like, people you hate, or people you like a lot, and then you're broken up in small groups, how do you deal with that? I think that's what you need to learn in school. And even in your CCAs or extracurricular stuff, I think this is where you learn the most skills from, this is where you pick up the most things from. In fact, your CCA or your extracurricular activity pretty much tells you what your passion is really at, in, uh, whether or not it's going to be a future career, maybe not, but it's something that you're really interested in. That brings me to the next point. What's your side hustle? Okay. Side hustles are important. You need to have something else in your life other than your main thing. So for example, my main thing is my job. 
my side hustles are my exercise thing, my photography thing on Instagram, my car driving thing, going to, to driving to Chiang Mai and stuff like that. Those are my side hustles. Side hustles can get you stuff too. They get you opportunities. They could be your second option for a job if your first career fails. Tough food. Uh, <laughs> but it's basically the side hustle is there to give you extra drive you know, every day. Nine to five, you, look, you do work, whether it's, any, whether, it's your, whether it's a real job you love, but you still need to sometimes take your mind off it and do something else. Just to refresh, give your brain something to, to chew on, right? So always have a side hustle. Who knows, one day your side hustle might become your main job. My wife, for example, left her 9 to 5, and she now pursued a career doing fashion design because that's, that was always a side hustle, and she's now doing it as a full-time. So don't, don't limit yourself to what your job has to do. Always do something else and explore. Sewing and reaping in every work, every career, every job, every project, there's a season of sewing, season of reaping. Sewing sucks. The time of sewing sucks, to be honest. That's when you're doing the grind work, planting the work, getting your hands dirty, spending the sleepless nights. And nobody sees that. Nobody knows when you're sowing. What they only see is when you're reaping. And when you're reaping, that's when all the good results come if you actually sow hard. And that's when the, your grades come, your projects go, go come to pass, maybe win some awards along the way. So always remember, in any point of time, you're always doing a sowing job or a reaping job. Don't do a sowing when you're supposed to reaping, and don't do a reaping when you're supposed to sowing. So don't try to sow things when you're, get things done when you're supposed to finish the project and try to change things or do stuff like that. Highlights and benchmarks. So, for example, okay, so that's a quick announcement. We won Changi as a pitch. Uh, our office won the pitch. After six months of non stop work, for those who were following me on Instagram before, uh, like my interns, who made them, who made them follow, um, <laughs> late nights, hours burnt in the office, weekends burnt. I missed my birthday, I missed my friends' birthdays, I missed seeing people. Everything was all on WhatsApp, nothing in person because I was always, always in the office for five months, uh, almost every single day. And that's because we're working hard. That was us sewing. That was us working behind the scenes to try to do our best to win the pitch. And when you win, people celebrate. But they don't see it. Unless you're in the industry, unless you're in the industry then you know that a lot of work went in. But otherwise, people see this as like, wow, you guys did it. So cool. It must be very easy. It's not. I like some benchmarks. So always not, don't compare yourself to one another uh, based on what they show. What they show is very easy. It's the curated part of you that you show. In fact, some people like to say, like, hey, your homework do it here. No, no, I haven't done it yet. Like. Actually, at home do it a lot. You know, that kind of thing. Or they try to like, pretend they're not working hard, but they're actually working hard. So never compare, never try to benchmark against one another. It's pointless. It doesn't get you anywhere. And lastly, the one thing I feel that um, applies to everyone is grit. I'm, I'm paraphrasing one of the previous TED Talk person so that I feel more intelligent. She said, <laughs> the secret to outstanding achievement is not talent, but passionate persistence. Keeping on, keeping on. Just soldiering on. Grit is really important. Without grit, you give up, you fall off. You don't want to do it anymore. You may be talented at something, but because of one failure, you give up. And what's the point, right? So grit helps you through everything. And for the guys here who haven't gone through army, you will know what grit means. <laughs> so society and parental challenges, uh, personal challenges. My last slide, last two slides. Basically, you will face parents or the old school guys who tell you, you can't make a career out of being a creative. Uh, there's no money. Uh, you know, um, they'll say that why you want to do that when you can do this go, go be a doctor, be a lawyer go, go be a surgeon I mean those are great jobs, no, no doubt but if you really love what you do, pursue it people nowadays can make money from anything you can be eating on YouTube and you can make millions you can be opening boxes on YouTube from presents and you get millions to be honest it's quite crazy but see you never know what's out there and what's interesting is that you guys are at the forefront now that you guys can do, do new stuff and just try. No one's going to judge you. You're not even going to work full time yet. So don't worry. Just go and try. And don't let anyone limit you on what you can or cannot do. And if you have time, I'll play this last video. It's from a commercial by Apple. And I find it really inspiring. We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. Medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. Quote from 
commitment, O me, O life of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of cities filled with the foolish. What good amid these, O me, O life? Answer, that you are here, that life exists and identity. That the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. That the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? Okay, go by uh, uh, no, <laughs> um, So I think this, that, I'll have to wrap it up. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the talk. I think my main giveaway is basically I hope to inspire you guys to pursue something in creative, whether it's a full-time job or a side hustle. I think there's a bit of creativity in everybody. It's only whether or not you have let it surface or you have exercised it like a muscle. I think if you don't use it, you might lose it one day and you just need to bring it up. Whether it's a side hustle or a full-time job, I think there's a creativity in everyone and you just embrace it. Thanks. Thank you.